It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. With these words published in the magazine called All Year Round in April 1859, began the serialization of one of Dickens' most tragic and celebrated novels. Tale of Two Cities ran in Dickens' magazine until November of that year and marked a distinct change for Dickens in both style and structure. All of Dickens' first paragraphs carry within them the nugget of what's going to happen afterwards. In A Tale of Two Cities, the key idea is two-ness. Uh, we are looking at, at two things over and over again, obviously, London and Paris. But not only that, two generations. We have the older generation, the younger generation. There are even two Lucys. There's Miss Pross plus her brother. It turns out that the wicked Marquis has a twin brother. Everything happens twice. What is significant about the opening of paragraph is that it focuses on the times, on the period, and the relationship between the past and the present, rather than on the complex lives of individuals. Although Tale of Two Cities can be classed as an historical novel, and indeed the French Revolution creates a powerful backdrop, it is the characters of the novel who both carry and drive the plot. In the reunion between Miss Manette and her father, Dr. Manette, we see the powerful product of Dickens' new approach. Good day. Good day. You're still hard at work, I see. Yes, I'm working. <laughs> you, uh, you have a visitor, you see? What do you say? Here's a visitor. Come. Here's Monsieur, who knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. <laughs> Show him that shoe you're working at and, uh, tell him the maker's name. It's a lady's shoe. A lady, young lady's walking shoe. <laughs> And the maker's name? 105 North Tower. Is uh, that all? 105 North Tower. You are not a shoemaker by trade? No, I'm not a shoemaker by trade. No, I'm not a shoemaker by trade. I, I learnt it here. I taught myself. Monsieur Manette, do you remember nothing of me? Look at me. Is there no old banker? No old business? Have you, uh, have you recognized him, monsieur? Yes, for a moment. At first I thought it quite hopeless, but I have unquestionably seen, for a single moment, the face I once knew so well. Hush. Let us draw further back. You're not the jailer's daughter? No. Who are you? It's the same. It, it, it can't be. When was it? How, how was it? It was the night I was summoned forth. She, she, she had a fear of my going, though I had none. And later, when I was brought to the North Tower, they found these upon my sleeve. It can't be. Was it you? I entreat you, good gentlemen, do not come near us. Do not speak. Do not move. What is your name? Uh, gentle angel. Oh, sir. At another time, you shall know my name, and who my mother was, and who my father, and how I never knew their hard, hard history. Oh, good gentlemen, thank God. I feel his sacred tears upon my face and his sobs strike against my heart. Oh, see. 
thank God for us. If without disturbing him, all can be arranged by leaving Paris at once, so that from the very door he can be taken away... But to consider, is he fit for the journey? More fit for that, I think, than to remain in this city so dreadful to him. Mm, it's true. More than that. Monsieur Monette is, for all reasons, best out of France. Say, shall I hire a carriage and post horses? No, that's business. And if business is to be done, I had better do it. Then be so kind as to leave us here. You see how composed he has become. If you will lock the door to secure us from interruption, I do not doubt that you will find him when you come back as quiet as you leave him. When a writer uses a historical situation, it very often means that they use elements from their own life but coming across in disguise. In Dickens's own case, the thing that he needed to disguise by setting a tale of two cities 70 years before the time when he was writing is what was going on at, at home. He'd been married for 22 years to Catherine Dickens. He had fallen in love with a young actress called Ellen Turner. Everything was breaking up for him. The fact that one of these chapters in here is called Recalled to Life, it's as if Dickens himself is a kind of embodiment of Dr. Manette coming back to life in the excitement of this new sexual discovery that he's making late in life. The relationships and events which occur between Miss Manette, Carton and Darnay illustrate the many facets of love and the startling contrast in Miss Manette's two suitors despite their similar physical appearance. In the triangle between Lucy Manette, Sidney Carton and Charles Darnay, it's as if he's playing out this scene, except that Dickens is both Charles Darnay and Sidney Carton. He is both Charles Darnay, Charles D for Darnay, D for Dickens, remember, and Sidney Carton at the same time. Except that Charles Darnay is, of course, this kind of fantasized, ideal, good version of himself. And Sidney Carton is the reckless, dissipated, hopeless, lazy, manic, depressive side of Dickens' self. I fear you are not well, Mr. Carton. No, but the life I lead, Miss Manette, is not conducive to health. God knows it's a shame. Then why not change it? I can never be better than I am. Pray forgive me, Miss Manette. I break down before the knowledge of what I want to say to you. Will you hear me? If it will do you any good, Mr. Carton. If it had been possible, Miss Manette, that you could have returned the love of the man you see before you, he would have been conscious this day and hour, in spite of his happiness, that he would bring you to misery, pulled you down with him. Since I knew you, I've been troubled by a remorse that I never thought would reproach me again. I've had unformed ideas of striving afresh, of fighting out the abandoned fight. Or oh, a dream that ends in nothing. But I wish you to know that you inspired it. Will nothing of it remain? Oh, Mr. Carton, think again. Try again. No, Miss Manette. All through it, I found myself to be quite undeserving. But yet, I've had the weakness and still have the weakness to wish you to know with what a mastery you've kindled me, heap of ashes that I am, into a fire. A fire, however inseparable in its nature from myself. Quickening nothing, lighting nothing, doing no service, idly burning away. Since it is my misfortune, Mr. Carton, to have made you more miserable than you were before you knew me, then I... Don't say that, Miss Manette, for you would have reclaimed me if anything could. Will you let me believe, when I recall this day, that the last confidence of my life was reposed in your pure and innocent breast, and that it lies there alone and will be shared by no one? If that will be a consolation to you, yes. Not even by the dearest one ever to be known to you? Mr. Carton, the secret is yours, not mine, and I promise to respect it. Thank you. And again... God bless you. Be under no apprehension, Miss Manette, of my ever resuming this conversation again by so much as a passing word. I will never refer to it again. Nor I, Mr. Carton. My last supplication of all is this. 
think now and then there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. Farewell. At the last, God bless you. Well, I think the characters of these three figures are too thinly drawn for this to be interesting as in an emotional uh, or psychological drama. I think it's primarily there as a device for uh, allowing Sidney Carton to make his uh, symbolic act of self-sacrifice. The centerpiece of the novel is undoubtedly Darnay's second trial. The manner in which he is undone has been interpreted both as Dickens displaying a deep sense of irony and as an ill-conceived fault in the plot structure. President, I indignantly protest to you. This is a forgery and a fraud. Who and where is the false conspirator who says that I denounced the husband of my child? Citizen Manette, be tranquil. There was a document found in cell 105, North Tower of the Bastille. Let it be read. Certainly, citizen. I, Alexandre Manette, write this melancholy paper in my doleful cell in the Bastille during the last month of the year 1767. Some hand may find it there when I and my sorrows are dust. In the last month of the tenth year of my captivity, Hope has quite departed from my breast. But I solemnly declare that I am at this time in the possession of my right mind, that my memory is exact and circumstantial, and that I write the truth. So help me God. In the late evening of the 22nd of December, 1757, I was forcibly persuaded by two strangers to accompany them to their home for the purpose of treating a patient who, upon examination, proved to be a beautiful young woman in a high fever of the brain. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. My husband, my father, my brother. She has a husband, father, and brother? A brother. Do I not address her brother? Certainly not. I had been with the patient for some half an hour, and she remained in an agitated state of disquiet. My husband, my father, my brother, hush. There is another patient. Is it a pressing case? I suppose. You'd better see. I am a doctor, my poor fellow. Let me examine this. I do not want it examined. Let it be. How was this done, monsieur? A crazed young common dog, a serf, forced my brother to draw upon him and has fallen by my brother's sword. We are very proud, these nobles, doctor. We common dogs have a little pride left too sometimes. Have you seen her? I have seen her. She is my sister, doctor. Good girl. She was betrothed to a good young man, too. A tenant of his. They were all tenants of his. That man who stands there. The other is his brother, the worst of a bad race. She married her lover that she might tend to him in our cottage. He was ailing by that time, poor fellow. She had not been married long. When that man's brother saw her and admired her and asked that man to lend her to him. For what are husbands among us? What did the two then to persuade him? They harnessed him to a cart and drove him all day and night. But he never gave in. Finally, after many days, he collapsed. He sobbed twelve times as the noon bell struck and died in her arms. Then that man's brother took her away. Her father's heart burst. I came here to confront him. A 
common dog, but sword in hand. First he tossed me some money, then struck at me with his whip. But I struck at him so as to make him draw. He tried to defend himself. Thrust at me for his life. Now lift me up, Doctor. Marquis. In the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon you and yours to the last of your bad race to answer for them. I mark this cross of blood upon you as a sign. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. It was a full week after the young man died that his sister eventually followed him. My knowledge of this shameful episode brought me here to my living grave. But now, I believe that the mark of the Red Cross is fatal to them, and that they have no part in his mercies, them and their descendants to the last of their race. I, Alexandre Monette, unhappy prisoner, do this last night of the year 1767, in my unbearable agony, denounce to the times when all things shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and to earth. Charles Darnay, nay, Evermond, you are hereby found guilty. Take him back to the concierge and death within 24 hours. Dickens always knows that any one story is not the whole truth. So by the time we hear this terrible tale of what happened to the sister of Madame Defarge, she turns out to be, we are completely sympathetic, of course, to Charles, who is the descendant. So it's utterly terrible that Alexander Manette should have cursed the whole uh, succeeding generations of the Evremond family. Dr Manette ends his account by denouncing the Evremond family to heaven and earth, uh, and that denunciation then escapes his own control and has a life which he can no longer uh, contain. And I think that is the historical irony, that people say things and do things which have consequences that they can uh, then no longer control. Of all the characters Dickens created in the novel, one of the most vivid and difficult to pin down is Madame Defarge, for she can be seen as embodying all that is good and bad about the revolution. The wife of Evremond, where is she? On my way yonder, where they reserve my chair and my knitting for me. I am come to make my compliments to her in passing. I wish to see her. If those eyes of yours were bedwinches and I was an English four-poster, they shouldn't lose a splinter of me. Now, you wicked foreign woman, I am your match. You woman imbecile and pig-like, I take no answer from you. I demand to see her. Or stand out of the way of the door and let me go to her. I don't give an English tuppence for myself. I know that the longer I can keep you here, the greater hope there is for my darling. I'll take every hair off your head before I let you lay a finger on me. Poor wretch, what are you worth? Let me look in that room behind you. Never. As long as you don't know whether or not they are behind that door, you are uncertain what to do. They have been on the streets from the first and nothing has stopped me. I will have you from that door or I will tear you to pieces. 
Madame Defarge is one of Dickens's most successful or most memorable characters. And I think there's a very good reason for this. During the actual period of the real French Revolution, people got very worried about the role of women in the French Revolution. There was a, a rise in obsessions about democracy and obsessions, therefore, about the rights of women. And Madame Defarge is a version of that kind of caricature of what had happened to women. I think Madame Defarge is neither exactly a righteous libertarian or simply a bitter, revenge-driven woman. I would see it slightly differently. I would see her as a woman who begins with an entirely justified sense of outrage and injustice, uh, but in seeking to, in seeking vengeance for the terrible injustices which her family have suffered, she is taken over by the spirit of vengeance to such an extent that she becomes inhuman. Carton is desperate to make his life worthy and uses his love for Miss Manette to prove these intentions. While Darnay languishes in jail awaiting his execution, Carton puts his plan into practice and Darnay is unwittingly duped into escaping from the Bastille. Of all the people upon earth, you least expected to see me. I could not believe it to be you. I can scarcely believe it now. You, you are not a prisoner? No. I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come from her. Your wife, dear darling. I bring you a request from her. What is it? You have no time to ask me why I bring it, or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Take off that coat you wear. And draw on this of mine. Quick, put your hands to it. Put your will to it. Oh, Carton, there is no escaping from this place. It never can be done. You will only die with me. It's madness. It would be madness if I asked you to escape. But do I? When I ask you to pass out at that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Change that cravat for this of mine. That waistcoat for this of mine. Carton, dear Carton, it is madness. It cannot be accomplished. It, it can never be done. It has been attempted and has, has always failed. I implore you not to add your death to the bitterness of mine. Do I ask you, my dear darling, to pass the door? When I ask that, tell me it is madness and remain here. There are pen, ink and paper at this table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Steady it again and write while I shall dictate. Quick, friend, quick! Write exactly as I speak. To whom shall I address it? To no one. Begin. If you remember the words that passed between us long ago, you will readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them. I know. It's not in your nature to forget them. Have you written, forget them? I have. Right on, there are but a few words more. I'm thankful that the time has come that I can repay them. That I do so is no subject for regret or grief. Well, what vapor is that? Vapor. Something that crossed me. I'm conscious of nothing. Take up the pen and finish. If it had been otherwise, Enter there. Come in. Mr. Carton's fainted. He is, of course, giving himself up for another. I suppose the modern equivalent would be somebody who 
could swap places with somebody about to go to the gas chamber in Auschwitz, perhaps. It's something, though, which is very calculated in Sidney Carton's mind, because he knows that he does not have a life before him. He, of course, it's noble. It's absolutely wonderful. I mean, the end of the novel is so fantastically moving. And one of the things that I think particularly clever about it is that Sidney is recognised as somebody he has never been by the little seamstress. And she calls him brave, she calls him noble, she calls him all the things that he's actually never been in life. But the truly brilliant thing about this sacrifice is that now he can never, never, never be out of Lucy's marriage, out of her life, out of her mind, out of her heart. The novel concludes with surely one of the most touching scenes in literature, as Carton comforts a young seamstress and they await their fate, as Dickens himself described, the two stand in the fast thinning throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone, eye to eye, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart. A Tale of Two Cities is often seen as one of Dickens's slighter and least successful works, but I see it rather as a very powerful vision of history and of historical determinism, which is given particular force by Dickens's rather ambiguous attitude towards violence. Uh, he both recoils from violence but also imaginatively participates in it and I think this gives a particular strength to the scenes of revolutionary terror in the novel. The real importance of A Tale of Two Cities and why it's lasted so long, why people still read it, is because while on the one hand it's set against a huge drop backdrop of a very important cataclysmic world event, the French Revolution, it at the same time deals with the individual life the value of the individual life, how important it is that one person has lived and how important it is that that person dies. I think you were sent to me by heaven. Or you to me. Keep your eyes upon me, my child. And mind no other object. I mind nothing while I hold your hand and I'll mind nothing when I let it go. If they are rapid... They will be rapid. Fear not. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you just one last question? I'm very ignorant, and it troubles me just a little. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin, an only relative, and an orphan just like myself, whom I love very dearly. Poverty parts us, and she knows nothing of my fate, for I cannot write, and if I could, how should I tell her? Is it better as it is? Yes. It's better as it is. If the Republic really do good for the poor, and they come to be less hungry and always to suffer less, she may live a long time. She may even live to be old. But what then, my gentle sister? Do you think it will seem long to me while I wait for her in the better land, where I trust both you and I will be mercifully sheltered? It cannot be, my child. There is no time there, no trouble there. You comfort me so much. I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? Is the moment come? Yes. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. <laughs>